Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for another episode of The Ghost Furnace. I am Bond and I'm here with my cohort Nick Pennsylvania. How you doing, Nick? Doing very good this evening. Excellent. And we are also joined with a return guest, Travis Watson. How you doing, Travis? I'm doing well. Yourself? Doing very well, thank you. We're super excited to talk to you uh, because we had you once on before to talk about one of the uh, some some previous books that you have. This one, however, is a particular book that that, w- that just came out in uh, was it November of 2023 from Beyond the Fray. Um, That's publishing. correct from beyond the beyond the fate publishing this one is titled the forest poltergeist class b encounters and the paranormal and this is a book that i really really enjoyed i mean i've really honestly man i've enjoyed all of your books um i particularly love black phantom dogs mysteries in the mist uh and canadian monsters and mysteries uh there's a few others there's sasquatch canada and a novel i believe I've written, yeah, my first book with Beyond the Fray was a novel called uh, Hunting the Beast, uh, which actually has a phantom black dog as a character, um, which is what got me started writing oh. nonfiction books. They ask me, oh, you know a lot about this. Could yeah. you write a book about phantom black dogs? And, and that's five how books it's... later. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it started. That's how it started. That's awesome. But uh, yeah, we're really excited to talk about this book tonight because, again, I think that not only was this book really enjoyable and that I learned a lot, but I think you have a particularly eloquent way of kind of framing a lot of like the nuance around some of these stories that we're going to be dealing with. Really just excited just to have this conversation and for everyone else to hear it that hasn't already read the book. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get uh, get things kicked off, Nick. Yeah, so the the book is The Forest Poltergeist, and the subtitle deals with Class B experiences. And I was hoping, just for clarity of conversation for anybody listening that's not familiar, you define it in the book, but for the conversation tonight, could you define what a Class B encounter is? So when you begin to do research into the world of Sasquatch, Um, One of the things that you quickly come across is this idea of Class A, Class B, and Class C encounters. Um, I don't deal really with Class C encounters because they're a little too vague to to do much of anything with. But a Class A encounter is what I covered in my book, Sasquatch Canada. This is people who are out and about doing hunting or whatever it is that they happen to be doing um, who actually see a Sasquatch whatever a Sasquatch is. You know, as we were saying when we start, before we started the show, nobody's an expert in this. We don't really know what this is. I'll Mm -hmm. drop my, you know, my standard text here is I believe the witnesses. Yeah. You know, they are seeing something. And I am not completely opposed to the idea that there might be a giant bipedal primate out there in, in the Canadian wilderness, particularly. I mean, there's tens of thousands of square kilometers of of land out there that nobody ever gets onto. No humans get onto. It's it would be perfect habitat for a large a large megafauna type animal to live in. Um, right. You know, we've got bears, we got wolves, we got all these other kinds of creatures out there. There's no reason why you couldn't have a sasquatch if such a thing. You know, if there is actually a physical creature. Um, I don't, you know, I don't have a problem with people believing that. So a class A encounter is where somebody visually sees a Sasquatch. Um, You know, so we've got that. Now in the world of Sasquatch research, we have something called a class B encounter. And this is where things start to get weird. These encounters are attributed to Sasquatch, but we have a situation where people are reporting things like uh, rock throwing, wood knocks, vocalizations, vocalizations, uh, these tree structure things that people are reporting all the time. There's this wide panoply of things that people are reporting and they're attributing to Sasquatch. However, nobody actually sees this, sees the creature. You know, they don't see the creature mm-hmm. actually doing these things. They just happen. A really good example of a Class B encounter. Um, 
comes from the old Monster Quest uh, video, uh, Monster Quest television show. Um, yeah. They had an, uh, a, uh, there's an actually a Canadian case uh, is up in uh, Northern Ontario where they go, they're investigating this cabin where there's been reported Sasquatch activity. You know, they spend some time there. They're excited about uh, possible DNA evidence from this trap thing that some guy put I, down. I love um, but at the end of that episode, um, I did some research. I, I listened to uh, an interview with uh, the producer of the show, and uh, I've obviously seen the show a couple of three times right. because it was one of my favorites. It's great, um, yeah. And, you know, and... Uh, some other uh, you know events that happened around that and basically what happened is that uh one of the crew went out onto the porch of this cabin was being a little lazy and, and urinated over the side of the porch mm -hmm. and as he was doing this a rock came flying out of the out of the forest and pinged onto the to the uh the metal roof of this cabin you know, and everybody freaks out. They all run back in the house, right? And and there's you know there's rocks coming down and and hitting the roof of this cabin. Um, some poor schmuck cameraman <laughs> got stuck out on the porch. <laughs> yeah, with, with and he had both a uh, 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 infrared uh, thermal camera mm -hmm. and night vision. Nothing. They yeah. see nothing. And there's your book, I absolutely believe, nothing. You, uh, but you described them as rocks. either the bravest or the lowest on the rung. That's probably the lowest on the totem yeah. pole. Because <laughs> everybody else is cowering. This is the thing right. that I found hysterical about that episode. Is everybody else is cowering in the house. It's like, right. my God, you have activity. Why aren't you out there looking for this? Right. Thing, right? This is the thing you were hoping to oh, like, encounter. Oh my God, there's people throwing rocks at us. <laughs> right. Like, the thing that we oh, were hoping it, to encounter is out there. Let's let's hide in the cabin. There. And now we're going to hide in the cabin. <laughs> I found it hysterical. But anyway, this is a classic, uh, very classic Class B encounter where you have this rock throwing incident. Um, you know, there's obviously something, some force throwing rocks. You know, bears don't throw rocks. You know, this is the thing that people say all the time. Well, you have to have hands to throw rocks, right? Correct. Maybe. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later. But, uh, you know, so... Instantly, everybody jumps to Sasquatch, right? It must be a Sasquatch throwing rocks at us. And part of what, the, or, well, all of what the Forest Poltergeist is about is not necessarily, <laughs> that is not necessarily the case. Now, again, as I said, I don't have a problem with there being a physical creature. Could be instances where they do wood knocks or they throw things or whatever. But when you look at the, the, the Sasquatch databases, Mm -hmm. And you see how common these encounters in the forest are, you know, whether it's wood knocking or rock throwing or some mm -hmm. combination of, of things. You know, I, I mean, really, Sasquatch would have to be as common as human beings to, to do all this stuff. Right. You know, we're supposed to be talking about this very rare bipedal primate mm. that is supposed to be shy yeah. of people for the most part. I mean, if you read some of the Indian legends, that mm -hmm. kind of goes by the wayside, but mm -hmm. um, you know, you're supposed these these creatures are supposed to avoid human beings and so forth, and yet we have literally hundreds, maybe thousands, of these class B encounters where people are having these experiences in the forest mm -hmm. where they're not actually seeing anything, but they're having all these odd experiences. So, I mean, the Forest Poltergeist is all about proposing kind of some alternate explanations for why people are having these encounters in the forest that don't have anything to do with giant bipedal primates. Right. Well, and and I appreciate that just because, as you said, this is supposedly a very rare thing. There have been <laughs> many people at various levels of seriousness spending earnest time mm -hmm. in pursuit of further evidence and it has been hard won what has been you know achieved oh, yeah. so to to think that it's it's doing all of these things i agree i i know that if you sit underneath a tree that a squirrel is in a squirrel will drop things on you but that's a far cry from throwing 
rocks from the Snowgrove Lake incident, right. and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the Snowgrove Lake incident, or uh, you know, there, are, you know, I kind of divided things up in the book. You know, rock throwing and and right. wood knocks and all that sort of thing. You know, I mean, there are plenty of of examples in the book of people encountering something mm -hmm. that's not just you know dropping rocks on you but actually they're right out of them. the forest well, in, and, 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 and near your campfire and so forth and your title's very deliberate with the, the forest poltergeist because and of course the, uh, so many of the things that you mentioned and you cite this in your book as well so many of these things that are occurring, the vocalizations, the bumps in the night, essentially, are so many of the experiences that people associate with poltergeists and hauntings and what, whatnot. And um, Brendan, I know you well, have comments and well, questions based on that. The thing that got me started on this, um, I was actually, I don't know if I can mention another podcaster. But oh, please I, do. We do it all the time. Okay. <laughs> so I was on uh, Where Did the Road Go? with um, Soraya Azkaz. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I've been on for every book that I've had. Out. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Soraya's, yeah. Soraya's been a, a, a very supportive of me um, over the Absolutely. years. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, so Soraya and I, you know, tend to banter back and forth or t talk quite a bit before and then sometimes after and, and so forth. Right. And, and during the show as well. And he's had had this opinion with other people that he's talked to too and his basic thing was it's like okay you take all of this class b stuff that people are reporting about sasquatch you move it into a house what do you have then it becomes a poltergeist case right um and I got to thinking about that, and I said to him, you should write a hmm. book about that. And he said, right. I don't have time. <laughs> yeah. I said, well, do you mind if I write a book about it? <laughs> and the Forest Poltergeist is actually, the, the title is actually a takeoff of, um, I think that he and, and um, uh, Tim Renner and, mm -hmm. and some of the guys yeah. that he hangs out with yeah. were actually calling it the... Um, Wildengeist, I think. The Wilderness Poltergeist yeah. or, or Wilderness yeah. Geist, yeah. yeah. Um, so cool. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I mean, and I give Sarai a lot of credit in the book um, because it, it was, you know, it was basically it was his idea um, and he let me run with it and I really appreciate that. Um, but, you know, it's true that if you take all this stuff that people are reporting out in the woods and you put it in a house, you'd have a poltergeist case. Now, we don't know what a poltergeist is either. Right, right, <laughs> um, right. And I have a lot of fun with that at the end of the book. Um, but mm -hmm. we do know that there is a long tradition in psychical research of these quote-unquote hauntings, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to call them that, uh, that, it, that have this very physical... Um, right. Excuse me. Have this very physical aspect to it, um, right? And 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 as I did the research and looked at various poltergeist cases, I quickly discovered that there isn't anything that happens out there in the wilderness that I can't find an example for in in poltergeist literature. Right, and I think that's um, so, that's such an interesting parallel to draw. One of the poltergeist cases that you speak about in or wrote about in the book that I thought was really interesting that that I had never come across before was the Anglican Window Company poltergeist. Oh yeah. Um I found that one in a blog. <laughs> really? Yeah, that one that was yeah. so do you mind do you mind so, giving a, a quick high level of that because I think that's a good example of like here's a poltergeist case that has a ton of stuff that um that people might not be as familiar with that might be fun to juxtapose to some of the stuff that we already mentioned that happens with quote unquote Bigfoot in the. So I was looking, uh, I was looking for a, a shorter case to start off with uh, in the book before I got into things like the black monk of Pontrefact and, and right. you know, the other guys and other, the, some mm -hmm. of the more famous cases, yeah. um, some of Colin Wilson's cases. And I, I wandered across this, and I, I cannot, I honestly, it's it's referenced in the back of the book. I can't remember the name of the uh, the, the blog right now. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful little blog that comes out of England, uh, out of the UK. And um, 
this uh, this person wrote a uh, an article about this uh, this window company, um, and their poltergeist activity over over the course of time, and it, it, it was a very as you say it's a very good example of of a poltergeist case that starts off with you know levitating carpets. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, there's people who are in a in a meeting room. And um, and they're watching as the the corners of their carpet just kind of fold themselves up, uh, and they're like joking and, about it and stuff. Like, oh, isn't and they're that joking like about it. <laughs> now, the the interesting thing about this case is that there's all this weird crap happening in this building, mm -hmm. and the people, for the most part, instead of being frightened, are just kind of put off by it. Right. It makes and me they think find about... it irritating. Yeah, it makes me think about almost when you're in a near accident. I don't think you're scared. I remember Brendan and I were actually on our way back from college once together. Nearly were involved in a, in a pretty heavy car accident. But in the moment, mm. and then for minutes afterwards, it was no big thing. It was it was a kind of a, there was yeah, levity like, in it. Yeah, it was like a whoops a daisy. Oh, wow. and then <laughs> like, like, oh, crap. Yeah, like, oh, and yeah. It, <laughs> and we've, we've talked about this well, before about with a lot of hauntings and whatnot you would think they'd be kind of more mundane things like carpets pulling up or in the you water know. and right not not yeah. really mm -hmm. dramatic all the time and so i i do think there is something true to the the old scary movie thing which is things people dismiss a lot of things for a long time but then it sure. builds up my belief would be that you would just be a, a preponderance of little things. It wouldn't necessarily be building up per se. I, I mean, this, this whole idea of witnesses being kind of blase about things. Um, you know, in Sasquatch literature, for instance, a lot of times, uh, you know, a lot of people like to make a big deal about how frightened people are of Sasquatches, right? But if you read a lot of these Class A encounters, uh, you know, the ones like in Sasquatch Canada, it's almost like these people saw a um, a bear, you know, in the woods. Now, they're describing a giant bipedal primate. All of, Almost all of the witnesses that I mm -hmm. talk about in, in, in Sasquatch Canada um, are, you know, they're like people who've been hunting their entire lives or police mm -hmm. officers uh there was one special operations soldier that that had a really interesting uh sighting but all of these people you know they'll see this thing and they'll go oh that doesn't belong here <laughs> you know, one of these things it's not like the other right and it's it's like they've seen a a, a bear or an elk mm -hmm. or some other large animal out. Seems very physical. Uh, yeah, it seems very physical, and they're very they're you know they're like wait that that's not supposed to exist. So there's that, but there's not the you know overwhelming terror that a lot of people uh, talk about. There are those encounters, and and I I don't dispute that. Um, and there's you know all, all of this uh, idea that you know Sasquatch is capable of using infrasound and that sort of thing and, and creating terror in people to get them out of their territory and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, you know, but a lot of these things are just like, you know, okay, look, there's a Sasquatch. <laughs> right, know? right. They're very, um, pa very and, passing, very and, pedestrian. And by the sense. same token, uh, we see in this particular instance, we see this, this uh, you know, like you said, Folks in this in this conference we were joking about this weird thing that was happening with the carpet, mm -hmm. you know, um, and and then they just kind of got ticked off about it because this force, whatever it was, this poltergeist was doing things like locking people in the bathroom um, right. or locking doors that were supposed to be unlocked uh, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, there was the, the classic pooling of water um, happening. Right. Uh, you know, if I recall, it was some kind of a, a viscous substance that was on the ceiling. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody knows. It's like just 
the yeah. the old spiritualists would have said, "Oh, ectoplasm." That's what know. it sounded like. Uh, yes. Yeah, maybe it sounded like maybe. ectoplasm. You know? Yeah, yeah. And it's like so. Uh, I, I'd be I'd be good with that. You know? Okay. Yeah. There's <laughs> ectoplasm on the ceiling. Okay. The 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 poltergeist slime the ceiling. It was right. Going, <laughs> one part of the, yeah. the house to the other right and again, um, and again that so, feels very physical know, yeah and, and again yeah um there's one uh there was across the street from this uh from this window company um, um i believe it was a coffee or tea shop and the, the owner was opening up one day and heard this tremendous crash from the building so he was running over there and he encounters the uh, the office manager who's you know, she's she's getting pretty blasé about this because yeah. it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. um, they run upstairs. I think they were on the third floor stuff. There's a door lock that's not supposed to be locked. They finally get in there and they discover that something has shifted this huge armoire from one side of the room to the other and actually broken one of the windows. Yeah. Which is um, really a poltergeist thing because yeah, for yeah, me, yeah. poltergeist was always, now, it moves stuff. Yeah. So, and one of the things that, that I point out in the book is, you know, this is like a large armoire. Um, there's another uh, a poltergeist case where a, a state trooper, um, I think it was in Virginia, you know, reported that when he was investigating, he stood and watched as a uh, uh, a large chest of drawers or armor type yes. piece of furniture shifted across the room mm -hmm. um, and testified later that it took him and everybody else in the house to move it back. So whatever these, uh, whatever this force is, it is capable of moving very heavy objects, um, which is, you know, integral to the idea of, you know, you know, Sasquatches tying trees together Tree or doing all this kind of fun stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, but, you know, this activity continues for about a year or so um, and starts to peter out um, like most poltergeist cases do, starts to peter out after, after a time. Um, if you read the poltergeist literature, there's actually people that theorize that the, you know, the poltergeist operates on a curve you know it starts off small with little scratchy noises mm -hmm. and that kind of thing and then ramps up to the you know armors moving around your house and then and then uh, back down to no activity at all so there's kind of a curve there right um you know the interesting thing of course is that these people who are reporting encounters out in the woods are not there for the most part, for an extended period of time. So we don't yeah. know how long this activity has been going on. Right. Um, it could have started off with the little scratchy noises and, you know, little little things yeah. moving around and then ramped up. And they happened to be there at the time where there were rocks being thrown around. That or peak almost, yeah. Or, yeah, or at the time where it was peaking. And I've heard that curve that you mentioned, one of the, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you've heard it too, both of you, the, the theories and some of the earlier poltergeist rationalization was that it had to do with young people in particular mm -hmm. who were entering a certain age of maturity and that the, the occurrences would become gradually heightened until they reach a certain age. We, you know, there's that time you know, puberty isn't the right word for it, but there's definitely a time in one's life when you're trying to separate yourself from your parents and kind of find mm -hmm. who you are, where you're emotionally heightened. And uh, I've heard it said about that. But then again, too, a character like that, a person that young, isn't going to be in the middle of the, you know, of this company at all times, nor are they right. going to be living out in the woods, you know? <laughs> yeah. Parapsychologists call it RSPK. It's a yes. recurrent, recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. And the theory is that, um, and it's not, it, it, one of the, 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 the things that, that they've realized as they've gone along in, in parapsychological research is it's not necessarily always kids. Um, right, they're, right. What seems to be the, uh, the factor there is that you have an individual who is repressing emotion, um, who is um, not able to express that emotion. And Lloyd Auerbach describes it as somebody having a psychic temper tantrum. 
Right, <laughs> right, right. So, so basically the theory is that because of this repressed emotion, certain people who have a psychokinetic gift of some sort um, begin, begin to manifest outwardly what's going on in, inwardly. Um, and that's when you get the, the, the large scale uh, uh, poltergeist outbreak type things that you see. Right. And, you know, as, as Nick was saying, um, a lot of times if it's a, it's a situation where the outbreak will start to resolve itself when the situation begins to resolve itself or when the kid starts to come down from all the hormones or whatever it is that's, that's provoking all of this, uh, this inner storm. I put some credence to the RSPK theory, but mm -hmm. I don't think it explains, I think, that, that it may be that these outbursts of PK may be attracting something else um, because you get, as in a lot of these poltergeist um, stories, you start to get apparitions and, and other things mm -hmm. going on um, that make you think that maybe there's a, a spiritual presence as well as just this random chaotic psychokinetic energy happening. Right. And I think that like that's a that's a great point to kind of transition to the idea of Sasquatch as a, like how that relates to apparitions. Um, because that's, that's something you, you cover in the book and we kind of talk mm -hmm. about sometimes. And, um, and that's something that, that like, you know, uh, n not everybody uh, has heard of that, be has heard of that kind of like theory before. So can you, can you kind of like talk about that a little bit? The sure. idea of Bigfoot as a, as a ghost basically yeah so uh, you know and again i'm going to stress this i am not one of those people who poo poos the idea that there could right. be a, a physical entity however uh one of the things that that people are saying or will say a lot of times when you raise the idea that sasquatch or some sasquatch sightings could be apparitional is the idea well, well you know when you say apparition what's the what, what pops into your mind? What pops into your mind is sort of this gray, misty... Um, woman in white. You know, her, spooky yeah. woman in white yeah. kind of, you know, going up the stairs kind of thing, right? However, if you look at the Tyrrell book on, um, which is the classic, G&M Tyrrell uh, mm -hmm. wrote the classic book on apparitions. It's about 15 feet thick. <laughs> um, he's one of, those, one of those Victorian era writers who, you know, believe that, you know, if one was good, then 10,000 was even better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> details massive numbers of cases in this book. Um, and in a lot of these cases, the people seeing these apparitions actually believe that there is a person in the room with them, um, a physical person standing in the room with them. Um, you know, it's that solid. And in fact, some of these apparitions are so solid that, you know, if the apparition passes in front of a light, it blocks out the light. Um, so, you know, we're not talking about spooky, ghosty, misty, you know, things. We're talking about a, a phenomena that can manifest as a physical being, you know. Now, you know, most people don't run up and try to touch an apparition. <laughs> right right you know, right um you know we're in you know honestly most people are not going to try to run up and touch a sasquatch either <laughs> um so a certain percentage of those um uh, of those sightings that we have out in the wilderness could be apparitional i mean you know we know that there was for instance a a a very large bipedal uh, possibly probably bipedal um, ape that lived in uh, in Asia um, some, several thousand years ago. Um, you know, of course, some of the Bigfooters are like, oh, oh, well, you know, the Gigantopithecus, it was called mm -hmm. Gigantopithecus Blackie, you know, cross the land bridge and that's what Sasquatch is. Right. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe they're looking at the ghost of a G Blackie. <laughs> you know? Right. And... You know that that is manifesting itself as you know in, in present times. I mean, and if you saw a gigantopithecus walking, the the ghost of a gigantopithecus walking along, and it was in this full 
full body apparitional state it would look like a real creature to the observer to you. yeah and it would act like a real creature um because one of the things that we see in in human apparitions is that the the human apparition behaves like a human being right you know it right. does things <laughs> you know well, this is a um, perfect segue into to something that both brenda and i found really interesting in the book explains class b could explain some of these class b encounters in that different way you you create an analogy i'll call the analogy of of josh uh and before we started we were talking to you a little bit about that i don't know if you want to give just a, a, a rundown of the analogy but i i sure. thought it was i i thought there was a a nice simplicity it made sense and it ties in with like a lot of the stories uh, all, all together but i'll, I'll give mm -hmm. it over to you so like I said uh, earlier, we don't know what a Sasquatch is, and we don't know what a poltergeist is. Um, so I had a lot of fun writing this book, proposing different things that could be uh, a, a poltergeist. Um, and I talked about some of the, uh, you know, the human um, elements, uh, the random spontaneous psychokinesis, um, and did a little did a little analogy thing there too um and you know there are some other spiritual entities that have a reputation for moving things around and and so forth but you know when we study hauntings um we find a lot of it may not be full-blown poltergeist activity but we find physical activity happening in haunting sites right Mm -hmm. So my thought was, what if, you know, everybody seems to, to be of the opinion, or a lot of people seem to be the, of the opinion that some part of the human consciousness survives death. So in that, that part of the human consciousness that survives death becomes a ghost, for want of a better term, and can haunt things. But, you know, when you start talking about hauntings, immediately everybody thinks of, you know, the gothic house on the hill, right? With the fog right. and the, the lady in white going up the supposed stairs. To, it's supposed to be haunted, stuff, right? yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those, those are supposed to be the haunted places, right? <laughs> However, consider this. Okay, so we have a I, – I made this guy up. His name is Josh. You know, um, this is completely fictional, but this is a thought that I had. A, it was a thought experiment that mm -hmm. I put in the book. Right, right. So Josh is one of those guys whose happy place is the forest. He just loves getting out and camping and hiking and doing all the, all of the, the, the things in, in the wilderness. Um, so he is, is quite uh, taken with... The wilderness experience with the wildlife he's you know he's become an expert on his local forest and what all the trees are and what animals live there and about the whole ecosystem and you know he's maybe he's stuttered, studied where the water comes from and all this kind of stuff he is an expert on this particular uh section of woodland of wilderness so let's say that that uh um the josh is is you know, going camping in his his uh, his favorite section of forest, and uh, and he is unfortunately killed in a car accident. So, you know, a certain percentage of these uh, these consciousnesses that survive after uh, you know after death, you know, go on to, to wherever it is that people go. But you know, Josh is is like, no, nah, no, nah, I want to go to my happy place. You know, um, I had a mentor once who who was convinced that uh, you know that part of what you needed to do before you die was establish a death dream. What he called a death dream, um, mm -hmm. where you establish a place in your mind that you will go when you pass over, so that you have, can make your transition more easily, and then That's you can go on from there. Um, but and, and you know, I actually have a death dream so but um josh's death dream so to speak is this forest he loves this place this is his happy place so that's where he goes and he goes and he hangs out with the critters and he does all the things that you know he did in in uh you know in his normal life except now he doesn't have to go to work 
you know, he can, he Doesn't can sound hang out bad. there. <laughs> yeah, you know, he can hang out there all he wants, right? Um, you know, and and uh, uh, but of course, somebody like that is going to feel quite protective of his woodland, right? So let's say the local timber company comes in and clear cuts part of this. I don't think Josh is going to be a very happy camper, right? Right. I mean, right. it makes good sense to me, right? And uh, and if Josh has learned, you know, any of the skills around, you know, being an effective ghost, um, he can probably start to make some people's lives fairly miserable. And um, one of the reasons, it, not to just to butt in real quick, I really like this sure. analogy, is because it, again, like you said earlier, so many of these experiences are happening in the woods. If we put it in a house, you would say it's a poltergeist thing. And I think of so many haunted house stories where nothing weird Renovation. starts to happen. Exactly. And the, <laughs> that's exactly where I was going to go. So, yeah. 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 You know, I mean, again, if we take this and we put it in a house, you know, Josh is a happy guy. You know, he loves this house. You know, and and then some schmuck comes along, and decides to start knocking walls out. Right? It's gonna take him off. Same thing if you're talking about a section of forest, and then the weird stuff starts happening. People will go into the into this section of woodland, and maybe they'll experience uh, you know bipedal walking around their tent at night. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they'll experience some stone throwing, or they'll hear wood knocks. Um, one of the classics of poltergeist literature is is rapping on walls and stuff, right? Same thing. Translate that outside. <laughs> what is that bit? That's wood knocking, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so these weird things start to happen. And of course, because it's outside, must be a Sasquatch, right? Right. You know? But right. it's not. It can just as easily be the human dead who are, you know, uh, there is a... Uh, I, I read a story by, uh, or not a story, but a, a actual encounter that uh, the fairy seer R.J. Stewart had uh, in England, and Bob was was meditating on a um, on a on a grave mound and encountered someone who basically had agreed to become the guardian of this site after death. Um, and mm -hmm. and they had stayed there for all of this time, uh, been several hundred years, right? Um, so, you know, it's not a big leap to think that, you know, there may be some people out there that are so attached to this wilderness, to certain wilderness areas that right. they have, have become guardians for that particular wilderness area. And, you know, if you're out there, you know, shooting off guns and drinking beer and being a dumbass, mm -hmm. then, you know, there, there, there's a good reason why there are rocks coming into your encampment and trying to hit you in the head, right? Right. It's like, I, out of my space, man. Right. And I, and I think that, like, the reason this is so interesting is I think what it makes people kind of uh, face almost is in a lot of the different paranormal fields, whether it's ghost hunting, ufology, cryptozoology, um, like you kind of set out early in this conversation and in the book, like it's, it's this very kind of like uh, perspective based um, mm -hmm. interpretation of the phenomena that's happening and in assigning a source to that phenomenon. I think this analogy does a great job of making people come to the terms with the idea that we are, not talking about a plus b equals c for a lot of these things we're talking about a spectrum of experiences that probably overlap with another spectrum of sources that do not necessarily invalidate each other we're trying to diagnose right. something based on what it isn't by way of symptoms and not yeah. what it is by way of yeah. symptoms. yeah yeah uh, so a lot of and this is another theme that you'll find in my, my books <laughs> is <laughs> in 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 the parapsychological fields, whether it's Sasquatch research or ufology or ghost hunting or whatever it is, right? There's a silo effect. Yes. Yeah. You know? And so 
you know, there's, there's that old saying, you know, if you give a guy a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Um, in the same way, uh, you take a guy out in the woods and you tell him that there's things wrapping on trees or there are mysterious footprints or there's rocks throwing or any of this kind of stuff. It's Sasquatch, right? Right. I think we need to take a much more Fortean view yes. of mm -hmm. all of these phenomena and understand that there is stuff happening in the other disciplines that could be useful to our discipline. And that's Absolutely. kind of what I'm trying to do here with the whole class B encounter thing. Everybody mm -hmm. assumes it's Sasquatch, but there are so many other things that could be going on out there that are just as mysterious and mm -hmm. just as weird, just as much fun if you're like me. <laughs> right. No, and that's yeah. I think that's I think that's great because like you mentioned like with the the fields being siloed, like just like with poltergeist activity, if you take a just we'll call it light phenomena. Mm -hmm. If a light phenomena is just an unexplained light is happening way up in the sky, then it's it's a UFO. If it's happening in a house, then it's a it's a ghost. It's an orb. If it's yeah, or it's an ghost, orb. Yeah. If it's if if it's happening out in the woods, then it's a will o' the wisp or a ghost light kind of right. thing. Right. We've it's never same... been able to fully describe and characterize and taxonomize right. these things, but we know their environments. And yeah. they cannot cross yeah. over. Yeah, no, it's no, just... because if if they cross over into another environment, then they have to be something else because right. they've crossed from one silo into another silo. <laughs> so I, I would really, yeah, I mean, the thing that I try to do in in this book and, you know, to a lesser extent, my other books is, is you know, okay, let's look at this phenomena based on the idea that it's it's not A, it's not B. It's not C, it's not D, it's <laughs> all of the above. Right. You know? And because yeah. all of these things could be true. If you adopt a both and way of thinking instead of an either or way of thinking, all of these things could be true. You know, there could be times, a physical creature. Places. Yeah. You know, we could be talking about the human dead. We could be talking about the fair folk. We could be talking about, uh, you know, the strange, you know, psychic abilities of human beings and, and the ability of human beings to create thought forms. I mean, all of these things could be true depending on where you are, when you are, uh, and so forth. It's just that, you know, people want to, have that either or thing it must either be a sasquatch or it's a hoax <laughs> yeah. but yeah that's not necessarily the case right oh. I, I think i think nick's gonna say what i was gonna say so go ahead nick <laughs> i i was only gonna say be, before we even began we were talking about people become very fundamental in in their thinking on this and you you anticipated that some people may be um, put off by some of the things that you're su merely suggesting within the community. And mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it ties into that, it, the, the idea of the silo. And, you know, you, you become so focused on one thing that it's hard to look at it from a different perspective. Yeah, and I understand that, you know, I mean, because that way of thinking is, is much easier sometimes to do, you know, if you believe that Sasquatch is a, you know, upright bipedal primate, a really large upright bipedal <laughs> primate, then, you know, you don't have to think outside that box, right. really, because you've got all you can do to, and I, I have a great deal of respect for field researchers. I I mean, these guys spend, and women, spend hundreds, if not thousands of hours in the wilderness, mm -hmm. you know, trying to, you know, accumulate some evidence, maybe get a good thermal print, maybe get a good photograph, you know, they tr they cast right. tracks, you know, you got people like Jeff Meldrum who specialized in for tracks sure. and, and yeah, you know, I mean, I have a tremendous amount of respect for those folks. I mean, they have done great work. It's just that I would like to see other points of view in that field because right. I don't think that all of the stuff that, that is associated with Sasquatch is necessarily all about a large bipedal primate. And that's that was that's the whole point of this book. 
Right. And um, I think I think it's interesting that you bring up like the the perspectives that 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 people have and bring one of the people that we talk about a lot on this show because of his proximity is stan gordon and and you mentioned some of his work his work in, in I, the book. I love stan gordon's work yeah it's it's fantastic <laughs> he's, he's one of those he's one of those people who who just says okay look this is what the witness saw right yeah he yeah. doesn't try to extrapolate he doesn't try to put his own viewpoint on it he doesn't try to you know fit whatever it is into a box a particular box he just says right this is what the witness saw the witness was watching tv one night and uh heard a sound on the front porch uh, been having trouble with feral dogs so she scoops her shotgun up she goes out the front door and she faces off with a seven foot sasquatch the thing seems to be as surprised to see her as she is to see it and throws its hands up she thinks she's being attacked she blasts the thing with a shotgun and it disappears in a puff in a flash of light as brendan has that was the often report. described to me stan because i was aware of stan gordon through radio interviews because he's on the radio uh was more so years ago but uh brendan was the first to actually lend me a couple of his books and brendan has always described stan gordon as being the first to put for the idea like hey i'm not saying bigfoot or sasquatch and ufos are related but there seems to be a lot of correlation between the two and i At think in pennsylvania right right indeed <laughs> chestnut ridge area and, and oh I, golly yeah and i think that's that that example you just gave there is such a good one because it's like if we're going to say that we believe the witnesses, you know, and and you know, giving relatively um, even accounts of what they're reporting to these researchers, that doesn't fit with the paradigm of a mm -hmm. just a just yeah. a flesh and blood. Large know. bipedal primates don't just disappear in a flash of light. Sorry, right. that's yeah, <laughs> that's, that's not one way. Them work. hasn't been my experience. No. Yeah, just not. It's not. A, it's not <laughs> much of a trait. And yeah. yeah, well, three toed tracks. There's another example. You know, in, in Sasquatch Canada, I have a whole chapter called Strange Things where I recount some of the weirder Sasquatch right. Uh, right. encounters in, in Canada. And it, it, it's you have a native fellow who's driving down the road in, uh, and I think this happened in Yellowknife, which is up in the Northwest Territories. Um, driving down the road, sees a Sasquatch walking down the road. Now, indigenous people have a belief in these creatures. Um, so he's not like, oh my God, it's a Sasquatch. He's like, he's watching the Sasquatch as mm he's -hmm. walking down the side of the road. It's on, It's in one of those uh, cuts that the where the power lines go, right? Uh, he's watching this thing, and as he watches it, it becomes translucent. He can see through it. And it eventually, as it walks along, it just disappears. Again, this is not something that your bipedal primates do. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, and, gorillas don't do this. Right. Um, and if you if you said that was a guy in a Victorian garb, then you would say, oh, that sounds a whole lot like a ghost. Oh, well, it's a ghost, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's um, just... By the same token, there's another story. Again, uh, this is a, an indigenous kid. There are a lot of... of, of indigenous people up here in Canada, and they tend to live in wilderness areas. Um, this actually was was close to a city. Uh, it was in Manitoba someplace. I can't remember the exact city near Winnipeg. But um, he's out with his family. Um, and I'm, I'm straying from the forest poltergeist, but this is another one of my books. <laughs> this is Sasquatch Canada. He's out with his family. They're having a picnic. Um, they go for a swim in the river. Um, he's like, wants to be first in line for the hot dogs. So he gets out of the river and he goes trucking back toward, uh, toward their, their, uh, their picnic site. He's walking down the trail and he sees this enormous creature squatting next to a berry bush. And he's looking at this thing and he's thinking to himself, what am I looking at? What am I seeing here? And he very distinctly hears in his mind, you don't see me. Yeah, He's like, no, That's no, no. Nuts. What am I looking at here? <laughs> and again, he hears very distinctly this, this idea that he's not supposed to be seeing this creature. 
Well, apparently, whatever it is, the creature gets gets uh, gets in a huff and and stands up, and you know it's it's enormous. It's like eight feet tall, and it wanders off into into the brush. brush. Um, after making a, a strange sound, kind of the infrasound thing, kid bugs out. Right, he's like he's gone. It's back to his campsite, and all of his relatives are like, "Well, you look like you saw a ghost." And he's like, "No, no, no! I saw this. I saw this great big thing out in the woods there." And they're like, "Oh, you saw a bear?" He said, "No, I know what a bear looks like. That right. wasn't a bear." <laughs> and they're like, "I oh, maybe I you saw swear a Sasquatch." I heard this, and I think it was uh, by Baldy. What is it? It was like the mountain. Baldy. No, I'm trying to remember no. exactly. I mean, there. I'm sure there's probably a similar story from that area. Yeah, um, this is over by this, Cedar this was, Lake. This was in a in a park. Um, this was in a park that had a river running through it. So over, close to one of the major cities in Manitoba. But well, anyway, the, yeah. The it's, idea, though, is that the Sasquatch was kind of trying, you know, basically trying to mind control this kid into not remembering that he saw it. Which is a you know, strange it, thing for an it ape didn't to work. do. Well, <laughs> yeah, if, yeah. if it I were mean, in another again. place, we would we would say this is a Jedi, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, or you know, well, this was uh, these you know, these are not the Sasquatch a, a you demon see. or something. You know, <laughs> this is not the Sasquatch you were looking for. Yeah. Well, well, and, well, and again, but that but that does cross over to something you do talk about in one of, in in mm -hmm. in this book, which is which is uh, touching on the idea of. Um, poltergeists and Sasquatch phenomena possibly being attributed to demons, uh, which is something, you know, the, the, it is something that comes up a lot in, in a lot yes. of these, these, these conversations. Yeah, it's, it's an unfortunate thing mm -hmm. in the, uh, in the paranormal field that there are a lot of people now who are going into haunted houses or whatever. And, you know, if anything goes boo, it's a demon. Right. Right. First of all, a lot of these people don't even know what a demon is. Right. Um, because I, what they're talking about is the Judeo-Christian interpretation of uh, malevolent spirits. Mm -hmm. The spirit that we could call a demon has been known to humankind since, basically since the beginning of recorded history. Right. Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, all of those places had mm -hmm. uh, knowledge of these creatures or these beings mm -hmm. and ways to get rid of them um, right right so you know uh when you start to talk about demons um you have to become very specific mm -hmm. um and you have to define very specifically what you're talking about you're talking about a spirit that's never been human right okay so it's not a ghost okay you're talking about a spirit that um and i've got a whole list of these things in the book right i'll try to some of them uh you're talking about a spirit that seems to have a sort of malevolent agenda uh toward human beings seems to take kind of a gleeful approach to actually harming human beings right um, um I think is very interested in in the obsession slash possession of human beings mm -hmm. and this is why i'm kind of you know i'm really down on the notion that this class b stuff is 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 maybe being caused by de demonic beings because a demon is a predator and it specializes in human beings so if you're a predator that specializes in human beings where would you go a place where there are a lot of human beings right, right? that is not the wilderness <laughs> when you're talking about them quite a bit you're you're saying from that uh, christian background and everything and i think too it would be kind of selling short from from that world perspective, you know, would a demon just kind of throw rocks at you? Would a demon just yeah. be annoying? No, like we're again coming from that perspective yeah. because, as you mentioned, there's different culture, but they've been with us uh, from a time immemorial. I, I think of the Greek idea of the demon. Yeah. So yeah, and there's a, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, just to kind of finish up the thought I was having is, again, as Nick pointed out, uh, since these beings are interested in the possession slash obsession of a human being, then there are far better ways for them to 
get a foothold in somebody's psyche than throwing stones, knocking on wood, you know, maybe, you know, making some vocalizations or doing that kind of thing. Um, there's a, a lot better ways to scare people, right? So I just, I, I don't buy into the demonic interpretation of class B phenomena, haunting phenomena, any of that kind of stuff for the most part. I mean, yeah, it's possible that some of these people that are investigating hauntings on a regular basis, you know, hostile, very hostile right. hauntings may be encountering, you know, some of these beings, but I, I don't see it as something that's going on out in the woods so much. And now I forgot what we were going to talk about. Well, uh, oh, and I di apologize. Diamonds. My internet's diamonds. a little unstable. The, the, I might be interrupting. That's okay. I'm sorry. So to make things even more confusing, though, uh, when, when we talk about the demons, is mm -hmm. the, the word actually derives from a Greek word, daimon, which simply meant a And those spirits could, uh, you know, much like the fair folk, uh, could range across a wide continuum from beings that were actively uh, hospitable and, you know, well disposed to human beings to beings that could care less about us one way or the other to beings that were actively hostile toward us. Right, that spectrum, um, yeah. So mm -hmm. the, the, the Greeks had different words for different types of daimon. Um, it was, but of course, when uh, Christianity came into into play, anything that wasn't an angel was, you know, necessarily had to be playing for the other side. So it was automatically considered a demon. Being the animus that I am, I don't agree with that. But mm -hmm. you know, that's that's their perspective. Right, and and again, we don't know what these things are, and we're not like putting anyone down for their for their interpretation. No, of no, these no, 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 no. I, I, you know, there are. Certainly, forces in the universe um, that you could call demonic. You know, if you ever run across anything like that, definitely will make you want to bust out the holy water or whatever it is that you do uh, to right. get rid of the thing. Well, and I, th I think it's interesting that you do you do mention uh, uh, the fair folk there. Um, I th I think that for myself, that was one of the maybe like early alternatives that I remember thinking of as, as reading stuff on, on fairy lore and everything, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you hear like, Oh, a lot of like the kind of tricksterish elements to, to what they seem to do in the woods whenever, or not even in the woods, but whenever people get close to, to rats or fairy forts, they start just kind of messing with people, which again, if you put it in the woods of the Pacific Northwest, that mm -hmm. that starts to sound a lot like class B stuff, um, or even up in Canada, yeah, right, yeah, any, um, yeah, any, any, anywhere that's not a not 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 a, a wrath in in Ireland, you know. Yeah. But so, like, there is well, a, it, there is a precedent for some of this this conjecture, you know, that we're mm -hmm. that we're talking about. So, uh, harking back to to R.J. Stewart again for just a minute, um, in in conversation with him, um, you know, obviously he's very much into fairy lore. Um, and, and one of the things that he describes is that uh, the fairy seers in Scotland, uh, when they were removed from the land and shipped over to the New World forcibly, were despairing um, because they felt that uh, by doing this, they had lost contact with their, their fairy contacts, right? And what happened is that after they had been in in, on this side of the pond for a while, those contacts reestablished themselves. So basically, the fairy followed them over here. Well, now, yeah. if you uh, start to research the, uh, the fairy lore in, in uh, places like Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, it has very yeah. strong mm -hmm. um, Celtic, you know, I mean, fairy faith in Celtic country kind of overtones to it. The interesting thing about the fair folk the people of peace or whatever else, whatever other euphemism you want to call them is that the, other crowd, the people yeah. that dealt with them on a regular basis used those euphemisms for a reason. And it was to avoid invoking their wrath because they mm -hmm. knew without a doubt that uh, to invoke the wrath of the fair folk was to have, you know, all kinds of things happen to you. Um, Morgan Daimler, who's one of the, the premier uh, authors on, on the Fae, 
uh, right now um, in magical circles talks about you know i mean the 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 fae are known for being able to uh, you know i mean worst case scenario you end up dead but of interest to us in in this poltergeisty kind of outdoor wildernessy sort of thing is one of the things that happens when um the fae become irritated with you for one reason or the other and i'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute is something that looks a lot like a poltergeist outbreak right um there are a couple of examples in the book um it was believed in in uh, uh in the old country that uh the fair folk certain types of fair folk traveled from one place to another from one wrath to another for instance uh using straight path um and if you happen to build your house on one of those paths you were in trouble <laughs> because uh, you know, your children could start dying off your your cattle and so forth could start dying off you could have poltergeisty types and type encounters in your home you know all this stuff happening to you um in in one example where you know it was very extreme where the children and the family were dying off the the fellow went and contacted the local village wise person they came and said well look your house is parked on a ferry path um, he actually got a stonemason to uh, to take off that part of the house, and his problems were solved. I just like um, the idea that there's essentially a contractor that comes by and goes, well, oh, well, here's your problem right here. <laughs> well, here's your problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, you know, we like, see this here's a here's lot <laughs> this time of year. Here's your village wise person <laughs> coming by to say, oh, by the way, you're parked on a ferry path. <laughs> yeah, this isn't zoned uh, properly here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I tell the story of, of uh, from um, another one of the fairy lore, fairy lore stories has to do with uh, brownies. So it's a spirit that's yeah. pretty much uh, pretty common in the Celtic lands. Mm -hmm. It was very helpful. Um, and in fact, people made offerings to these beings to do housework or to do farm work. And in the case that, that I describe in the book, uh, this being uh, somebody insulted its work and there was an outbreak of poltergeist activity in the house and things flying around and rattling all around that culminated in the entire corn crop uh, ending up over a cliff. Uh, a couple of miles <laughs> from this house. Uh, so again, you have this very powerful kind of psychokinetic activity happening around these beings. Um, well, you know, so you know they're prime. And they are very much associated with the wilderness. They are extremely territorial. Mm -hmm. You know, so in my mind, they are prime candidates for. Uh, a lot of this, uh, you know, forest poltergeist type activity that's happening out in the woods. You know, it's right. like I would not put it past, you know, these beings to chuck a stone at somebody to get them out of their area, well, right. especially if they were being disrespectful. Right. Um, you know, it's it's one mm -hmm. thing if you come in, you know, you, you set up your tent, you're being quiet. You know, you're enjoying nature, you're, you're doing, you know, but, it, you know, you know how it is. A lot of people, they go out, they go camping, they drink a few beers, they get mm -hmm. a little loud. Uh, next thing you know, there's, you know, something throwing rocks at them or, you know, making vocalizations off in the woods. Um, and I, I think that the, the, the fair folk are, are prime candidates for some of that activity, depending on, you know, again, where you are and, and right. whose territory you've been around in. Right, and a lot. Another of those, interesting yeah. idea is: is Sasquatch actually a species of fae? <laughs> yep, that's. I was. I was just um, about to say. Yep, those all this sound is something so similar. That, yeah, this is this is a an idea that I played with in my novel, uh, where the uh, you know because I mean Linda Linda Godfrey talks about her mm -hmm. conversations with Ho Chunk elders, who said, yeah, Sasquatch, interdimensional being. It walks into our world. It takes a physical form. When it's done, it walks back into its world. You know, right? That's a, it, as far as I'm concerned, that's a fae. Right? Know? Yeah. If you if you take the word Sasquatch out and put in, you know, someone from the other crowd, it's the same story. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, yeah, because these beings, you know, when they're in this world, can have 
very physical effects. There's, you know, there's the stories of uh, young men who try to get into, uh, you know, the they have these circles, and in the circles, a lot of times the fairy, the fae, are described as dancing. Um, there are stories of young men trying to get into to these dances and getting knocked out. I mean, literally just getting punched out. Um, so these beings can have a very physical effect in in our yeah. world. Um, so I, I think they're prime candidates for for this kind of thing, along with the human dead, who, mm -hmm. if you read the fairy lore, are are very much interconnected with the fair um, Right. In fact, in some areas of the world, you can't tell the two apart. You right. know, that so, it seems like some proportion of people end up just crossing over into the other world and becoming fae. Right. So, I, think, I think what this kind of like push, pushes us towards is the idea, again, that like the, the effects or the phenomena probably have causes that are much more overlapped in those like venn diagrams than what we what our stories may initially tell us and that honestly where it's all coming from is probably quite more complicated than what most of us like to like to believe whenever we're taking that siloed approach that you mentioned yeah exactly yeah I, again we go back to the 40 in perspective that it's not right. a it's it's not B, it's not C, it's not D, it's all of the above. <laughs> and it just depends on where you are, when you are, uh, you know, maybe it even depends on what kind of energy you're bringing into the encounter. You know, human uh, perception, you know, I mean, some of these, you know, not so much the having stones thrown at you kind of thing, but some of these uh, uh, sightings could actually be... Uh, uh, psychic events you know i talk about this right. in the phantom black dog book where you know somebody's walking along dum -da -dum -da -dum, they're walking down a country road you know the mind automatically goes into a sort of a trance state you know if you're walking long distances mm -hmm. you know same thing if you're driving long distances and where do we see sasquatch all the time on the side of the road right as right. people are driving along down the road right um <sighs> but you know you we know that psychic talents tend to work better in a mind that is really relaxed and not focused on something. So, you know, you're walking along, um, you know, you have this sort of trance kind of happen to you and, you know, boom, you see a giant black dog with glowing right. red eyes on the side of the road because that's one of the, the local stories. Mm -hmm. Um that, that, that you hear often in, in these particular areas of the world, whether it's in Nova Scotia or Ireland or the UK. And I think that, you know, it's entirely possible that, that some of these apparitions that people are seeing are, are simply psychic events that they're having as a result of this kind of trance state. Mm -hmm. But again, I think this book, um, again, this is the Forest Poltergeist, Class B Encounters and the Paranormal. Um, I think you do such a great job of kind of just like laying out all the different just kind of questions that that we have and some of some of the possible overlaps of those kind of Venn diagrams. I know we've talked about a lot tonight. Is there anything we haven't covered that either you want to talk about, Travis or Nick? Any questions you haven't come across? I mean, there there is so much in the book. I think that if there were one overarching theme, it's what we've really been talking about tonight, and that not to silo yourself and the thing that i find most interesting from where i come from is simplifying it down to if you took these phenomenon that people are reporting and you put it in the setting of a house you get a totally different explanation so mm -hmm. i i don't want to keep beating that drum but i do think that that is the really interesting angle and of course you said it was arrived at through conversation and that perspective was so fresh to me that I, mm -hmm. I it kept me turning pages. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that. I, I really uh, I appreciate your feedback. I guess to close, I'm going to say that this book was really hard to write. Um, <laughs> I am known for writing books that are uh, fairly succinct. Yeah, you know, I don't go on for hundreds of pages mm -hmm. you know i try to to okay here's my topic 
you know, here's a good introduction to that topic. Here's some things to think about. And here's a bibliography. This book was really hard to write because yeah. I had two huge areas of research, um, Sasquatch lore and the lore of the poltergeist. Um, <laughs> and when I went down the and when I went down the rabbit hole for poltergeist, it's like you could write. Uh, this could have been a, a you know five volume yeah. set when you start talking about right. the lore of poltergeist, and then when you add Sasquatch in mm -hmm. there on top of it, it just it it, it was. I had to, at, at some point during the research, step back and say, okay, I'm completely overwhelmed. How am I going to handle this? Right. And, and as a result, the book ends up being very compact. Right. Um, because I was, I decided, you know, I'm just going to do a few cases. Um, I'm not going to go overboard with, with case studies. Um, I'm going to develop some uh, those analogies that you were talking about, mm -hmm. the, the little little uh, fictional stories that kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. I'm going to try and keep it succinct. Um, and I was I pretty successful at that. But if yeah. you look at the bibliography, it's like... <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so I would say, honestly, I think like not to just like, just like shower you with more compliments about this book, but I think like as someone who reads a lot of paranormal books, I think you in this book did a... Uh, exceptionally good job of transitioning from the from like one thought to another in like the different the different chapters um i try <laughs> well because because i think for some people when they read a paranormal book or if they're or if they're not used to reading books like this it can be a little intimidating with all the different backgrounds that we've been talking about and like you said the huge bibliography but um i think you did an excellent job of being like okay here's what we're talking about and here's how it's going to relate to the next thing yeah. and here, you know um it doesn't and, feel like buckshot Yes. Yes. That's a, that's a, that's a, again, much more succinct way of putting it, Nick. Thank you. <laughs> but so, uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, but so absolutely recommend everyone, uh, picking up this book. If you haven't yet, uh, where, where's the best place for people to find this and your other books? So all of my books are available on Amazon. Um, you can, you can order a soft, a soft cover or paperback, whatever they're calling it these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ugh, paperbacks. Um, it is available on Kindle. Um, and if you happen to be a Kindle Unlimited subscriber, you can read it for free. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Oh, right? nice. So yeah, they're, they're all available on, on Amazon. And I've just very briefly, I've written five books. The first one was on Phantom Black Dogs. Uh, the second one's called Mysteries in the Mist. It's about mist, fog, and clouds and the paranormal. Uh, which is a really interesting topic. It's probably one of my favorite books because it's just yeah. so weird. It is. <laughs> it is. It really uh, is. When I moved up to Canada, I wrote Cana Canadian Monsters and Mysteries, uh, just lots of lake monsters and UFOs and giant and, beavers. Uh, <laughs> and, and giant beavers. <laughs> um, then was Sasquatch Canada, which is my, uh, you know, as I said, it's about Class A Sasquatch mm -hmm. sightings in, uh, in Canada. And then uh, Force Poltergeist is what we've been talking about here. So that's that's number five. Number six is in the works. I'm awesome. not quite ready to talk about that one yet because the research is still in progress. Well, well, whenever that one is done, we'll we'll be eager to read that, and we'll be just as eager to have you back on to, to talk talk about that 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 book, hopefully. So definitely. Awesome. Well, uh, again, Travis, just want to just want to thank you. If anybody has any thoughts, comments, or, or feedback, uh, you can reach out to us at the Ghost Furnace Podcast on either Instagram or Facebook, or the Ghost Furnace Podcast at gmail.com. Yeah.